All right, so welcome everybody. Welcome to our webinar series. My name is Jan Lehman. I'm the owner of CTC Productivity and with me is my amazing team. Uh, those of you that have been following along in our webinars for the last year and a half probably know Nancy Kreschke. She's our 365 training extraordinaire, very patient and uh, able to talk at all levels of, uh, of technical skill set, let's just say, which is wonderful. Uh, Arnie Howes, you guys have met the last couple times. Arnie is our business process guru with a focus on 365 and in particular SharePoint is one of his passion areas. And then joining us today is Rafe Johnson and Rafe's actually gonna be doing our topic today and I'll give a little more background about Rafe, but basically Rafe's in charge of helping make sure CTC clients are set up securely, um, I don't know, consistently with the right compliance guidelines and all that good stuff. So I'll give you more background there. So. If you're new to our webinars, uh, the way we work it is we typically do about 30 minutes content and then open it up for Q&A. So if you already have burning questions, feel free to start entering those into chat. Rafe can start actually looking at those. And um, <coughs> you. the topic for today is actually going to be on securing your environment. And again, I'll kick that off a little bit more. Yes, like. Uh, whenever you get a chance, so like, are you going to oh, uh, let me know? Thanks, Nancy. Um, so the topic for next month is actually using Microsoft 365 to manage your organization using EOS. And if, for those of you that don't know EOS, it stands for Entrepreneurial Operating System. It is basically a methodology for how to run your business. The book Traction talked about EOS, and a lot of people know it as Traction, not EOS. EOS started in Minnesota where I'm located, and so a number of clients use EOS, and so we thought it was appropriate to have a topic on this because we have a lot of clients using EOS. Even if you don't use that, it is going to be a helpful session to talk about how is it that we communicate like our company objectives and goals down to individual department tasks, different things like that. Um, so even if you're not an EOS company, please join us because it'll help you understand how to use SharePoint and some of the other tools to really run your business more effectively. And I'm gonna do just a couple, couple slides and I'll pass it over to Rafe. So one of the things to know is we don't recommend technology just for the sake of recommending it. We, we often joke that we don't work for Microsoft, but we probably should though, because we often are recommending it. But we're really here to really solve our clients' business issues and help the company run more efficiently. And we find 365 quite often can do that. These are typical business issues that Microsoft 365 solves, typical issues, issues we see in every organization. So organization of information, man, what a time waste if people can't find things efficiently. Communication, as we all know, is a massive issue, and there's wonderful new features in 365 to help streamline that. Collaboration, a lot of sharing of documents. Our goal is to reduce meetings by allowing companies to understand how to be better at communicating and collaborating so you need less time around the, uh, the virtual conference table. Accountability has certainly been an ongoing issue in organizations. Again, 365 introduces some great tools there and then also some tools with prioritization. So if these are business issues you have, you're in the right place. Uh, we were very fortunate when COVID hit that uh, 365 existed because it allowed us to hop onto this fabulous platform. And now as most businesses are staying more in a hybrid model, uh, 365 again continues to be a really important tool to allow easy access for moving from a work from home to the office environment and for those folks that work remotely all the time. So access to anything from anywhere, which is awesome. We are actually starting to collect a lot of met metrics, uh, metrics with the clients that we're working with. We actually just put a case study out on the website. We helped a company reduce their emails by it was 60 to 75% by teaching them about more effective ways to communicate and collaborate in the team's environment. So um, just really amazing um, benefits that come there. These are some statistics from Forrester um, about the benefits they've seen for the companies using 365. All right, so I'm going to pause a second because we're starting to take the recordings and put them on YouTube, and this is a logical break. I wanted to introduce the topic for today, and it's a little bit different than what we've done in the past. We typically are gearing our topics toward end users and how to use the software to solve business issues. But we're seeing a, a lot of issues with a number of the clients that we're working with where we're getting in there, and Nancy's doing a training session, and she's like, 
everybody's on a different version of the software. <laughs> and then we're having companies that, that are supposed to be following really rigorous compliance standards, and we're realizing that they have a lot of exposure. So if we have any inkling whatsoever that there's things are not quite set up right, uh, Rafe is the person that we bring in to kind of peek under the hood and look and see what's going on, make sure you have all the right licensings, there's good version control, security is properly set up, et cetera. And so we thought, you know what, today, let's do a little pivot toward a more technical conversation. So if you're not the person in your organization, maybe that's responsible for this, if you think there's some good information here, uh, just realize that there, we put all of the recordings out on our website and you can have them go back to it. Nance, I forgot to mention that. If you can enter all the links into chat, that would be wonderful. So we've been doing this for about 18 months. We have lots of different past recordings. So Nancy's going to enter some links to our website to get to the recordings. If you want to sign up for the EOS uh, webinar in March, the link is there. You also can uh, subscribe to our, our YouTube channel. And I feel like there's one more and I can't think of what that other link is, but that's all right. So um, anyway, so at this point, um, we want to turn it over to Rafe, but um, that's a little background. We think it's important companies start to understand how to really set up 365 properly. So Rafe, you are on, dude. Thank you so much, Jan, and wonderful to be here today. We are going to talk about security overall, especially when looking at the tools that you're using every single day. Now, like Jan was mentioning, is I spend a lot of my time in a dark room looking at the back end of your security, the back end of your tenant. And today, I really didn't want to make it about all of the different terminologies, technology, acronyms that I could throw at you, because most likely you'll probably forget it by the end. So my goal really is no matter what position you are within your organization, in the back of your mind, almost everything you do, you should be thinking about it through a security lens even if it's for a couple of seconds when you're doing your job. Otherwise, if you are in that position to really make a difference, implement these policies and ensure that your organization is secure, hopefully you're gonna get some great tools, tips, because I will tell you as an IT professional myself, when I look at some of the security settings, some of the organization's backend, I get the little EVGV sometimes just because it's not secure and not, it's not where it needs to be. And with everybody working either from home, remotely, hybrid, or even in your office, security is every single thing you touch on a day-to-day -day basis within the organization. So hope to have some really good content here. If you have questions, even if it's a more technical question, happy to go through that at the end. We're definitely going to save some time. But without further ado, if we could go to the next slide here and we'll talk about just an overview. All right, so all of you probably even in your own life with the technology, the cell phones, whatever you use on a day-to-day -day basis, technology is rapidly changing. I don't know how many times I can say it, we see it in our life, it's there. And it's not just where hackers are evolving, hackers are changing and the different ways that they can get access to your system. It's also the technology security and protection itself that's also changing. So in the lens of Microsoft, which you're gonna hear me going back to quite a bit because that's the main type of tenant security that I put into place, security portals are being changed to security and compliance, or maybe you have a separate security and compliance portal where buttons, where toggles are, both the front end where hackers are getting in as well as the back end is changing. And that's really where I come into play, where we come into play because with everything changing, you need to make sure that you are on the top of your game when it comes to protecting your users, protecting your organization. And this is a little bit dramatic maybe, but in the lower left, cybersecurity is the new battlefield, which it is. Millions of attacks are coming in every single day. And most likely if you have access to your own email security portal, you would see that thousands of people are trying to either log in, attack, get your emails, get your files, and you probably don't even know about it. The good news is when it comes to security and compliance, if everything is set up correctly in the back end, you should be able to sleep peacefully at night knowing that you're protected, there's not much you need to do. But if you are in that cybersecurity, if you're in that security world, we want to make sure that you are up to date and you are taking a look at everything new that's coming out. Security skills are in short to supply, and that's not just because of the great migration that's happening within the workforce, but also having someone that you can trust that's staying up to date in terms of everything new coming out, what is the best security for you, and maybe even looking at it from the lens of how do we get the best security that you need to meet your compliance, ensure that all of your users are working correctly, working securely without breaking the bank, 
And then third here is virtually anything can be attacked. So this is a robotic arm, which probably doesn't have too much connection to you, but think of it as any place that you get your email from, whether it's your personal mobile device, whether it's your work laptop, desktop, maybe you have an Apple watch or a Samsung watch where you get your emails from, anything that connects to your work organization, connects to the internet, it can be attacked and within your organization, in the back of your mind, you should be looking at how do we really lock down all of these endpoints as they're called, because if there's something connecting to the internet, if you're accessing content, most likely it can be hacked or gotten into. Next slide here, please, Nancy. And this is where I'm gonna spend most of my time today. It may look simple on the screen, but each one of these three key pillars really play an important part in your security posture, your security within the organization. Operations, where I like to start, is a huge broad category ranging from your users that are getting into their emails, what devices they're using. It goes into what type of devices do you have? What type of software is on those devices to protect them, to secure them? And on top of that, are you using third-party tools, softwares to connect to other, let's say maybe you're using Zoom, let's say you're using Slack, or maybe you have a cloud-based version of QuickBooks, or you're using an online CRM. Every single place that your user is going to touch, sign in with their Microsoft, sign in with their Google account, all of this I'm gonna throw into operations. And there's a couple of key pieces to ensure that your operations are secure. Why is it important as well? Most attacks, most breaches come in due to user error. Our users not understanding what is happening within their organization. So take, for example, if you are logging in with your Microsoft email every single day to get into Teams, to get into your email, most likely you're familiar with entering your email address and your email password and your write-in. Well, if you, for example, click on a phishing email, which is where someone's sending you a link, you click on it and then you put in your credentials on a page that someone can track. If you just have your email and password, someone can get right on in. They can access your emails, your files, potentially even your CRM. And not only is that a huge data breach, but they're basically getting access to everything within your organization, which is scary. Like I said, it keeps me up at night. So one of the first parts of operations when I look at an organization is, do they have MFA turned on? And MFA in this case is multi-factor authentication. If you have an online bank account, if you sign in online to pay for your credit cards, you're probably used to putting in your email, your password, and then receiving a text, receiving a code, or if you get a one-time passcode to then enter, that's what multi-factor authentication is going to do. And it is one of the simplest ways for you to secure your organization. I cannot stress how important MFA really is because it provides a secondary line of defense. And even if someone gets your username and password, maybe let's say you wrote it on a sticky note because you can never remember it, please don't do that. I've seen it before, please don't do it, not saying that's best practice whatsoever. But even if you did, if you have that MFA, you're going to get that secondary protection where you put in your code, you prove it's you. And most organizations that I go in and see don't have this enabled. Or if they do, maybe they just have the ability to get a pin to their email. That might not be secure because like I mentioned, if you have your Apple Watch, if you have your iPad tablet that you're using, if someone gets a hold of that other secondary technology tool that you're using, they could still get in. So modern authentication, modern MFA is putting in, maybe you can still use your cell phone to get a code to, or maybe you wanna use the Microsoft Authenticator app, which gives you a nice little approve or deny. We can have it just go to your work phone for you to get in. And so, what this has- So Rafe, about that multi-factor when I first set it up, I, I was out at my parents and I get, and my, my authenticator app asked me to sign in again and authenticate. And I'm going, uh, I'm not sitting in my office. So I don't know who's trying to get into my account, but I am not going to authenticate. So when I got back to my office and I sat at my computer, it was asking me to log in again. So it was my, it was my computer asking me, but I was freaked out. So <laughs> I always tell my clients, if you get an authentication request and you don't know why, do not say yes. Exactly. Yep. And the good news is when it comes to setting up the back end correctly and having that trusted person do it is we could have a situation where we say, 
we want the MFA to remember you for 30 days on your device. If that's allowed for your security posture, we can do it so you don't have to MFA every single time. Maybe you're in a more compliant organization where you do need to put in that MFA every single time, which I do recommend as it's more secure. There's ways to then balance that security requirement as well as a little bit of ease of use, but you are absolutely right, Nancy, that do not accept it unless you know it's you, because that could be someone potentially trying to get into your organization. The good news on top of that is, let's say the worst thing happens in the world where someone gets a hold of your smartphone, gets a hold of your watch, they have your credential as well, logs in as you. Microsoft does have a lot of protections when it comes to identity management. So where if you log in, let's say you're based out of Minneapolis and you log in from Minneapolis every single day, you logged in at noon, and then someone else who has your credentials is trying to log in from Eastern Europe, log in from Asia, Microsoft's identity protection and management, if set up correctly, will automatically flag that user as a risky user because physically there was no way that you could log in at noon from Minneapolis and log in at one o'clock PM from Beijing, for example. So MFA, great for a start. There is a lot more tools we can put in in the back end as well. So even if all else fails, the smart Microsoft AI, artificial intelligence behind the scenes, will still protect your account. This is why I love Microsoft. We do wanna make sure that you have the right license to use this if this is something that's really piquing your interest, which we can talk about later. But just note that there are layers and layers of security all based off of that one user login, which is so important because if you have single sign-on, for example, so your user account can log into your Microsoft email, that same email address can log into your Salesforce online instance or your CRM, everything's tied to that one account. And we wanna make sure that no matter where that user account is logging in as, we can still secure it all through the Microsoft AI intelligent security portal. The second part that I'm going to bring up when, with operations is a part that I feel is often over missed and that's devices itself. Mobile device management or just device management as a whole, shortened as MDM, is what devices are users using to log into their email, log into their outlook.com or their desktop apps or whatever they're using to open up to access your company content and material. If you have users that are working remotely, there might be a chance that your organization has purchased their laptop, handed it off to them. Well, what happens if that person were to leave the organization and you don't get that laptop back? What do you do about the files? What do you do about the emails on it? Or what if someone in your organization is accessing their work email from their own personal mobile device? If they don't have a pin on that phone or if they don't have a password or security to get in, if they leave that mobile device in a taxi, they lose it in a park, they forget it on the bus or an airplane, if, they, if you can't control some part of security aspect of that phone, well, that is a data breach. Someone could take that phone, get into their emails, get into their files, and especially if it's someone higher up, there really is a risk of just company information that you would never want to be leaked to get out there, even if it's something as simple as someone losing their phone, no matter where they're at. So that's where Microsoft comes into play as well within the operations of enabling you to join your work PCs, join your work laptops, mobile devices, whether or not you purchase it for them, you can join it to their Microsoft email and put out basic security policies like requiring a PIN, making sure that their office apps are up to date. Because if they're not, for example, that would then allow someone to potentially hack in, get into a vulnerability in the back end. So ensuring your devices are connecting, have basic security, or even from a single pane of glass, pushing out things like antivirus, anti-malware, on the device so you know that everything is up to date, it's secure. And thinking about the last slide is with everything constantly changing, if you don't have a single pane of glass to then control policies within your organization and to all of the devices, you're really missing out on a huge component of the Microsoft security compliance world. That particular, that particular tool within Microsoft is called Intune or Endpoint Management. It does require a license to use it, but when I'm in there, I take a look at the devices, potentially risky users, where people are logging in from. And I wanna make sure that every single piece, every single 
part of your whole entire technology ecosystem is connected and secure because it's no longer the world where you go into your office, sit at your one desktop on your local network to access everything you need. We're in a modern world, communication, collaboration is key, and we just wanna ensure that your security environment is keeping up with that. The technology part here is really, do we wanna go full first party Microsoft? Microsoft has a lot of tools. And if you look at me and roll your eyes and say, Microsoft Defender, for example, why would you use that? Well. The Microsoft of today, the Microsoft 365 that you've probably heard in the previous calls that we've had, it's not your father's Microsoft anymore or your mother's Microsoft. It is a new tool, a new technique to make sure that it is using Microsoft's AI, staying up to date. And if we can go first party to secure everything, I highly recommend it. Or if you still need your online portals, your CRMs, your Salesforce, all of those others want all of those other tools out there, just ensuring that that username, that connection is secure, all logging in through the one portal, which if you're an IT security professional, you would probably love the idea of going to one portal, one single pane of glass to then manage all of those user logins, see what other tools they're logging in. And if someone were to leave, you could go ahead, block their sign in with just their Microsoft email, and then you can feel secure knowing that they're not able to get into any of those other softwares out there, regardless of how many third-party tools you're using. And then the final one here is partnerships. Really, I classify partnership is of having a trusted security personnel team, whether that's internal, whether that's external, that you trust. Because a lot of people can say, well, yep, your tenant is secure. I checked off this box, you're good to go. That's not necessarily the case. Even within Microsoft and MFA, multi-factor authentication that we just recently talked about, within the Microsoft portal itself, there are three different ways you can enable it. One of those ways, which would be the legacy way of individually going by user to user and turning on MFA, it doesn't affect any new users you have. So that potentially brings up half of your users have MFA, the other half don't, just because someone forgot to enable it. Your trusted security compliance expert should be able to say, we're gonna get you on the modern MFA. Everybody has it. Whenever we create a new user, they have it as well. Just to ensure from start to finish, stem to stern, everything is covered. We can go to the next slide here as well. And some other questions you can look at is, how are you tracking your systems? How are you tracking logins? Is someone doing it? Is someone giving you a report? If you're in that management leadership position, have you ever requested for your security team to do a login audit or do a risky user login? If not, I would highly recommend it. It really doesn't take too long if someone knows how to use the Microsoft world. And you can really learn a lot of information about your security posture. Do you have a plan in place if credentials get compromised? If you have MFA, you should feel confident, secure that no matter what those external third-party users can't get in. But take a look at those risky users, take a look at those logins. They do need to be tracked and having a dashboard within your security compliance center, maybe even using something like Power BI, which is Microsoft's Tableau dashboard looking view, might be something you wanna look at. Otherwise, having a procedure, having a process in place, which if you are HIPAA, if you are NIST, if you are PCI, throw out any of those compliance technology terms out there that you might be adherent to, all of them most of them, if not all of them, do require you to have this process procedure in place. So having that partnership, having that team create the remediation steps, also something that you might wanna be thinking of and in the back of your mind, start even creating it in a Word doc, for example, just so you have it if and when the worst case scenario happens. We can go to the next slide here. On top of that, when it comes to content, Content can be just as important as emails, especially if you're saving your Word, Excel, PowerPoint, PDFs, large files. If you're saving your company files in a cloud-based or even an on-prem server, you want to make sure that your information is secure. If someone were to leave, no one can take it with them. Ensure that your information is not shared externally when it shouldn't be. And looking at how your files are stored, doing an audit on who has access to what, does it take some time? Absolutely. Is it worth it for you to sleep at night knowing that your company files that might have 
personal identifiable information, or maybe they have confidential trademark copyrights on them. Your company needs to have a safe and secure place to store their files. Microsoft does supply that. It does provide that through SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, a lot of those communication platforms. It is so important to go into the back end. A lot of these settings are toggles, but so important to make sure that your information does not be seen by people that shouldn't, and it is secured with users with permissions based off their Microsoft account email. And that's just the start. Maybe you want to put in retention labels. Maybe you want to put in sensitivity labels to say, this file, this email is encrypted, and only the person I share it with can see it. No one else, even if they get the link, can open it. Small things like that, which do take one click to turn on, so important ensuring that your files stay within your company. We can go one more slide here. And this is kind of this is going to be my wrap up slide since I do see that I'm nearing the top of my time here today. So remembering identities. Identities is how you log in your user account, what protection securities do you have available for your users to make sure that even if someone is not a technology expert, which most people aren't, are not the ones that are writing the emails, doing their daily job, making sure that they are secure, there's nothing they need to worry about, you've already taken care of that behind the scenes. Endpoint, these are your devices, whether that's your work PC, laptop, mobile device, Apple Watch, tablets that you have, all of those need to be protected and secured, especially if people are accessing emails and files on it. User data, this is the security, this is your compliance, your attention, your sensitivity labels, storing files in a place that you know exactly who can see it, and ensuring that maybe the line level associate might not be able to see your executive management files. I've seen that before where everybody had access to everything, which you may wanna take your organization in that route of transparency, but at some point you do wanna make sure that access control is in place by user, by the person logging in, so they can see what is relevant to them. Cloud apps, that's if you're using your third-party softwares, you can still do that. I'm not going to be the person that says, go Microsoft 100% on everything, because I realize there are some really good tools out there. If you use them, look at either doing a single sign-on so that person can use their Microsoft email with those tools. We can track it. We can look at where they're logging in for those. And even if you wanted to, you can make sure that they're working or they're actually logging into them. Kind of a side benefit there not really necessarily related to security. And then your infrastructure, whether you're saving your files in Azure, Microsoft's cloud, SharePoint world, maybe you do have an on-prem, which is like a server in a basement in a supply closet somewhere where you're storing your files, that's absolutely fine. And if you're using some of the old legacy technology, ensuring that it's still connected to these modern tools to give you a lot of the features that I'm talking about today. I've thrown a lot out here. Hopefully you found some information or some tidbits you, where in the back of your mind you're thinking, do we do this? Do we know if this is secure? How do we have MFA turned on? These are the questions that you should be thinking about bringing up to your IT security team because the last thing I want to happen is seeing a data breach on one of your tenants, seeing files being shared with people that shouldn't be. Really, these are things that are scary because it could take down your organization. It could mean that loss of trade secrets, which we don't want to have. So security is important. I can't stress it enough. There's a lot of different ways to put it into place. Just make sure you have a trusted partner that can walk you through it, help you every step along the way as it's a journey. All right. I, and then, yep, there's a couple other slides here. I did talk quite a bit just about the operation side. Microsoft does have its own secure score, making sure that everything within the tenant is being bubbled up. You get a nice overall number. I get a lot of questions about the secure score. What does it mean? Well, it's really just trying to give you a benchmark and a baseline for what tools you have turned on. So if you are the busy executive where you have only two seconds a day to maybe potentially think about security, maybe you just wanna ask your team for your secure score. They can take a screenshot, they can send it to you. And with this one number, you're not gonna get all of the minuscule details of everything that's turned on, but you get an idea of where are you standing, what maybe improvement actions can be taken, and how are you sitting at the moment. No matter what, there's always more things you can do. There's always more things to secure. There also needs to be that balance of, if I were to give you to a secure score of 100, 
Maybe that means I've locked everything down and now you can't get your job done. I don't want that either. We do wanna have that nice balance. We do wanna check off those boxes, ensure that your compliance and security needs are met while still ensuring that you have that communication collaboration internally to get your job done. All right, and on that note, if there are any questions, please feel free to write in the chat. Go ahead and unmute yourself if you're able to. I'm open. Don't wanna to go too much into the details of all of it, but if there's something that's kind of in the back of your mind that I talked about, or if there's something that I might not have mentioned that you've thought about security, happy to talk about that now. Awesome. So I'm going to wrap up really quick and then we'll open for Q&A. Rafe, you are so good about talking in a language most of us understand. If there was a term or a concept he said that didn't make sense, please enter it in chat because I think we take for granted some of the words we use all the time. Um, but that, yeah, so good. So I'm just going to hit a couple slides. Often people think all we do is 365. So we just a little clarity here. So um, definitely do a lot of consulting work and it, it typically does involve 365. You know, we come in and look at really your business processes where there's opportunity for things to run more efficiently. And if 365 can be a solution, then that's what we do. Um, again, quite often we're being hired to help companies go from Google or Slack over to 365 or upgrade to the next version of Microsoft, make sure they're compliant and secure in that space. Outside of that world, we do a lot of uh, training um, on anything related to productivity, being an effective leader, uh, anything with the Microsoft, you know, deep dives on OneNote or any of the, the apps within 365. We're doing a lot right now on how to run an effective meeting and project management concepts everybody should understand. And um, Nancy and I continue to do a ton of training on email, even though it's been around for a very long time, companies still don't really know how to use that tool. So. And so just a reminder, Nancy, you'll enter into chat all your links again. So again, if you found this uh, topic interesting and you want to redirect somebody to the recording of it, please go to our website. You can get all the past recordings. You can sign up for the webinar in March. Um, if you want to always kind of be abreast of what's going on with the webinar, sign up for our newsletter and then you'll get an email when we're introducing a new one. And again, if you want to sign up directly for our YouTube channel where we'll have snippets of this information, it's out there. And at that point, we'll turn it over to Rafe. And Rafe, I'll ask a starting question, if I could. What's a good What's a good security score? Is that what you called it? Yes. Yeah, so a good security score is, it depends. And doesn't it always depend? So depending on what type of compliance regulatory rules you might be adherent to, maybe you can get by with a secure score of 65% or 75%. Like I mentioned, rarely will you ever see that full 100% secure score. And the reason is, if I were to do that to your organization, most likely that will mean that you can't get to any of your third-party apps. You have to MFA every single second of the day when you log in. And I don't want you coming at my door trying to bang it down saying you've made my life too difficult. So a good score, when you look at just the Microsoft secure score as a whole, and it's constantly being revamped within the Microsoft world as well, overall the improvement actions are going to stay the same. I like to see about a 65 to 70% secure score range to be at your optimal level of productivity. Um, so there's some questions in the chat. One of them um, was, uh, we'll start with uh, Joe's question around how in the world do you remember all your passwords? And so I think, you know, we all know to recommend a password manager typically. Um, I'm just curious, Rafe, if you have a particular password manager you would recommend. Good and maybe, maybe explain what a password manager is, because that might not be understood. Absolutely. So if you're in the situation where you have 10 different online tools that you might be logging into, there's a potential that you have a different account for each one of the online cloud tools that you're using. So you may have a separate login for Salesforce online than you do for Microsoft, or maybe you have a separate profile for your Amazon account if you're purchasing for your business. So when you get more and more accounts, it's really hard to keep track of all of them. Absolutely, I go through this every single day and this is, <laughs> I'm really glad that you brought this up. Now, when it comes to a password manager, the first thing I will say is, a sticky note does not constitute a password manager. Please don't do that, please don't use it. A notepad saved on your desktop, not a password manager either. Why is that? Well, let's say someone gets your, in your office, someone comes up, sees your sticky note, they can potentially log in as you. Or if maybe your kid is on your device 
or if your cousin is on your device, they see that, they could potentially log in as you to all of your office, all of your work tools, which we don't want either. So a good password manager is going to be a place that you have to log in to see all of your credentials. Hopefully it has MFA on it as well. If you don't have MFA multi-factor authentication on that password manager, get a new one or implement that immediately. Now, personally, I use a tool specifically for IT management side, so it is even more secure than that. It's encrypted. There's a lot of different steps I have to go through to get in. But even if you use something like Edge, so Microsoft Edge in and of itself is Microsoft's browser, light years ahead of Internet Explorer if you're used to that. And within Edge, they do have their own password keeper as well. You do have to be logged in as your profile with MFA to get it, but you can store those passwords in there. You have to prove you are you in order to see your list. That's something that we can walk through if you're looking for something kind of built in that's more of the freemium model. model. Or there's a lot of other ones out there. There's, there's actually something called Password Keeper, or you might be familiar with LastPass. Those are a lot of different tools that you can use. Personally, I prefer keeping it all within Microsoft as much as possible. But no matter what tool you use, make sure it has MFA, make sure it has a user account you can log into that you can remember that password because the last thing you want to do is write down your password to your password keeper. But having some type of tool definitely helps as well. And for your organization and the operation side helps move people away from saving their passwords in a notepad on their desktop, which is not a secure way of doing it. And I've used LastPass for years. I'm yeah. super happy with that. Nancy, you're nodding your head. Is that what you use as, as well? Yes, I use LastPass. But I was just going to also, for others that want to learn more about it, that was our session last week. A lot was around password when we did the in case of emergency. Um, the, the one thing that I don't think you can do in the Edge password manager is share your passwords with somebody. Can you, Rafe? You cannot share it with somebody, and that is by default in design. Yeah, and the, right. and the main so, goal there is each person having their own pro profile, their own account to log in so you can track it. Right, so that's one of the things that I like about LastPass. If I need to share a password with a friend, a colleague, that I can go ahead and share that password with them without emailing it to them, texting it to them, calling them with it. Okay, so one of the other questions, and this came from Patricia, who I think Patricia is not part of a business. I think she's more individual. So the answer may vary and you might not know the answer, Ray. But the question was, how do you enable multi-factor authentication? Great question. And it really depends on what you're using for your main user login or username account. So if you are part of a business and you're using Microsoft 365, Office 365, as I mentioned before, there's three different ways to enable MFA. One would be through your legacy exchange portal, as it's called, where you would go one by one by each user, click on the enable. The next time they log in, they have to enter, enter their information, when, whether that be their secondary phone number, email, Microsoft Authenticator app, which is recommended. The problem with that one is that you have to remember each time you add a user to go into that portal to turn it on. If people don't remember to do that, it basically means that your user does not have it turned on, even though everybody else does. So I usually push people away from that method just because it's not proactive and it doesn't make sure that moving forward, everybody has an MFA. The second one, and probably one of the simplest ways, is to enable something called security defaults within Microsoft. And that is really a toggle within your backend security portal management. You'd flip a switch. That time, the next time the user logs in, they can enter their MFA. It's for everybody from previous moving forward. And with that, they even have 14 days where they can skip through until those 14 days end, and then they're required to put it in. So it's more of a soft, gentler, we're going to be pushing this out. You don't have to yet, but stay tuned. You will within 14 days if you don't. And then the third way is actually my favorite way, and that's called conditional access because we can actually put in different MFA policies for your normal users. So the people that may just have their email addresses and they're just doing normal day-to-day -day activities. We can do separate MFA policies for your IT admins who may have an elevated role and need more security in place because if someone logs in as that user, they can do a lot more damage in the back end than your normal non-role users can do. And then on top of that, with conditional access, we can even go further than that and say, 
if you are in a specific location, you, ought, you always have to log in using MFA every single time. Or maybe we wanna say, if you're not in the United States, Canada or Mexico, we're gonna just block your access completely, even if you do have MFA. So the legacy exchange portal is the first one. Security defaults, probably the easiest is the middle one. And then conditional access is my favorite because you get so many more things that you can do beyond just your traditional MFA. Um, so if anybody else has any questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself or enter in the chat. Patricia, we know you've got some questions about your personal setup. We're gonna kind of hold that to the end and let everybody go and then we'll see if we can help you. Any other questions? While well, you've got an, a security expert on the call. Uh, thanks, Joe. You always give good notes there. Um, well, thanks, everyone. Appreciate you being on the call, and we'll see you next month.